Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. This pain never goes away, ever. A mother speaks out encouraging others to break the silence and end the bloodshed. Is there really a customer base here? The work of LSU's Innovation Park is nurturing business ideas. How do you mother long distance? Artistic expressions of sorrow and pain from mothers living life locked up. Hi, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, Governor John Bell Edwards today signing one of the last outstanding bills from the legislative session. The $700 million is for road, bridge and port projects, 10 projects in all. That money is BP oil spill recovery money. And that was an announcement in West Baton Rouge today. Now a check on other stories making headlines across the state. Big announcement this week from Health Secretary Dr. Rebecca Gee. Beginning next month, the state will offer a broader treatment model to all hepatitis C Medicaid patients. Gee says it will cure tens of thousands who have the liver damaging disease. The state will pay a flat fee for five years for unlimited access to medication. That fee negotiated is the same amount Louisiana has previously paid for treatment of only the most severe cases. Businesses in the state have started receiving the first permits to sell CBD products or cannabidiol. This as new laws on hemp and CBD take effect. Permits have gone to liquor stores, gas stations, CBD shops, and other retailers. The state health department is in charge of the permits, while the ag department oversees the growth of hemp. A new study of oil seeping from a platform off the coast damaged during 2004's Hurricane Ivan shows spillage lower than recent estimates, but contradicting reports from the well owner. Taylor Oil Company says oil sheens indicate there's only a dribble coming from the site. Ocean experts say whatever the exact amount released, this is a slow, small seep that has not oiled wildlife or beaches. More than 6,500 educators wrapped up a three-day annual teacher summit in New Orleans today. The summit offers professional development training with topics from early childhood education to school improvement. This was the seventh teacher summit to take place. Beginning in August, 16 will become the minimum age to get married in Louisiana. The new law prohibits anyone 16 or 17 from getting married to someone three years or more older, and anyone 16 or 17 will need permission from parents and a judge to marry. Supporters say a minimum age can help protect teenagers from sexual predators. The planned expansion of a plant in the Ascension Parish town of Darrow is expected to create about 100 construction jobs. Veolia North America will spend about $40 million to expand its plant that recycles used sulfuric acid for use at oil refineries. So grieving for her oldest son, a Baton Rouge mother is speaking out in hopes of saving other families from the pain she's suffering. She wants justice for her son, but is calling for peace and an end to the gun violence robbing families across our state. A mother speaking out through incredible pain and grief, hoping her words will stop the blood from spilling. Young people, they don't realize once you pull that trigger, there's no taking it back. Her son, 29-year-old Lewis Robinson Jr., a father of three and up-and-coming rapper Lewis Badass, was shot and killed on May 2, 2018. To me, in Baton Rouge, it's just like a death sentence to be a rapper. You don't realize that it's always like a beef with somebody over a song. This song, one of his most popular Let Me Through This Be, landed him a record deal 
and is played frequently and was even highlighted by the Southern University Band. His murder on Cadillac Street in Baton Rouge in broad daylight is still unsolved. When I got the call, one of my other sons called me and he said, Mama Lewis got shot. So Lewis had been shot at before. So I was like, oh, somebody shot him, you know, in the leg or something. The mother of four boys and a girl was miles away getting invitations for her youngest son's graduation when it hit her. This was serious. The Lord said, get to your baby. So I left out of there. And when I say I, I drove straight from Sam's in Denham Springs to Eric K. Long, and I knew he was dead because me and Lewis was like so close. So I felt it in my spirit. Through her tearful conversation, she told me, as difficult as it is, a full year after his death, she's still hopeful and tells others who have lost their children to keep the faith. I have to keep praying for him. I have to pray for the killer who killed my child because I, I wouldn't want his mom to be in my shoes, you know, even though he killed my child. Mothers throughout the Pelican State are joining Robinson in a group no mother wants to be a part of. Statistics from the FBI show Louisiana had the highest murder rate per capita of all 50 states, a record the state has held for 29 consecutive years, from 1989 to 2017. Uh, Vito, you want to give me a hookup? Yeah, it's nice. Lewis Robinson Jr. was a veteran. He served six years in the Army. He did tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. His mother encouraged him to join. She says she felt he was safer overseas than in his own backyard. But he died here. On the streets of Baton Rouge. And he told me, he said, Mommy, I want to come home. I said, well, Lewis, I say, stay in the military. Mama, I want to come home. He said, I miss home. I want, I want to be back at home. I want to rap. And I'm like, Lewis, I say, you're going to come in and get yourself killed. Son, I say, stay there. He was hell-bent on coming back to Baton Rouge. And it wasn't even six years that he got killed. So you think if he had stayed in the military, he could be? It would have been a different? Yeah, I do. I have a son now in the Navy. He said, I'm not coming back there. You know, he, he refused to come back to Baton Rouge. As a mom and grandmother, Robinson is working to preserve her son's memory. She said she grieves even more for his children, who were just toddlers when he died. She says it hurts to think of all that they will miss out on by never getting to know their dad. The memories, they just, he's never going to be here to see them, you know, graduate, go to pre-K. You know, they so young. And just the other day, another reminder of his absence as she and her granddaughter came home from swimming lessons. He's buried over off of, on Plank Road. And we come in on Plank Road. She says, can I stop and tell my daddy? I said, tell him what? Tell him how good I did at swim lessons. So I pulls up. I said, well, I'm not getting out. She said, well, I'm going to get out. And she get out. And I mean, she walked to that grave and talked to him and tell him all about her day. You know, and it's heartbreaking. Her heartbreak, pain, and anguish fueling her mission, her message that much more urgent, begging those in the streets to put down their guns, encouraging them to live and learn from the mistakes that have taken far too many lives before their time. You know, I don't know who, whether the person that killed my son or not have kids, but if they do, how would you feel if it was your children that's going through this? You know, we have to, we have to get hearts and, and, and realize that you're not just hurting that person, you're hurting the moms, the kids, the grandparents, you know, and this pain never goes away, ever. It's the happy memories with her son that keep her going. In this video, she's singing his song while he's jokingly egging her on in the background. I was smell this part when we pass it through. That's the Bland Boss, 1000 Gang, AK the Hood Boss. Praying every day she gets through another day without her Lewis. I just want the community to step up and um, try to solve some of these murders and um, tell what you know, tell what you see. Now, if you can help solve the murder of Lewis Robinson Jr., call Crime Stoppers at 225-344-STOP or submit an anonymous tip on their website. Now, you can remain anonymous and could be eligible for a cash reward.
Innovation Park at LSU is celebrating 30 years of nurturing small business ideas and small business startups in Louisiana. This week I sat down with the park's new executive director, David Winwood. So I'm uh, heading up a pretty small group of individuals who are engaged in economic development, business development on behalf of the state working through uh, LSU. Uh, we have definitely responsibilities here around the capital area, capital region, but we also have statewide responsibilities. We work in close partnership with LED uh, as a, a sponsor of some of the things that we do on their behalf to put programs out across the state, particularly aimed at small businesses and uh, helping them grow, attract capital, and find partners in larger companies sometimes. So you have inventors, people who want to start up businesses, business mm -hmm. ideas. How yeah. does that work out? Yeah, so um, inventors uh, can be sometimes from LSU faculty. I think we've talked a little bit about some of the faculty who have startup companies located here on campus. But in addition, we have people from the community. We're not exclusively targeted at developing LSU-originated inventions. These can be from, from companies and individuals anywhere around the state. If they're a Louisiana-based operation or company, then they're a, a suitable client for us, typically. So what is their pitch to get in here and to become part of this group? It, it varies. I mean, we'll, we go from everything from a guy with an envelope with a scratch uh, idea of something that he thinks might work for an engineering application, they will typically come in here and, and talk with, with us, uh, with one of our counselors, with my colleagues, and express an idea that they think has some value. And we will sort of try and filter out whether this is something that looks as if it could have some legs, if you will, as if it might actually meet a purpose that is uh, needed uh, in industry. And we, we use a couple of different approaches that are uh, fairly uh, commonly used for this kind of work right now, the, the lean canvas approach and, and a, a couple of others, to figure out is there really a customer base here? And then if that's the case, we'll talk with them about creating a business model, a business plan, to, and, and then look at what are the best ways to get this thing funded. Most all of our companies are still just in the development stage. We have a few who are generating revenue. Many of them, though, are living on early investments and grants to sort of develop their business idea to a stage where they have commercial opportunities. So we really, we're incubating companies who are, you know, we're helping them get to a growth phase where they can launch off then and become a, a bona fide operating company with sales and, uh, and a workforce. One of the businesses that is just taking off Mm -hmm. is aquaculture system? Aquaculture system technologies, yeah. Tell us about that. So a uh, company that's been here a number of years, uh, former LSU professor, had a, has a technology uh, which is used to purify uh, water systems and initially his market was uh, aquaculture, so fish farming. Uh, he's subsequently or somewhat recently expanded that to large municipal water treatment systems. And they're uh, very busy right now. They have a lot of uh, orders for their technologies, for their uh, processes to be installed. And uh, they need manufacturing space. So we don't have that here right now. We're hoping to have it at some point in the future. So they're actually moving, and I think this is a great success story. They're moving into uh, a rehabilitated facility in North Baton Rouge. They're gonna maintain their relationship with LSU. That was very important to them, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, both uh, the connectivity just for the facilities, but also for students and interns. and uh, may also expand then into some of the other programs in other colleges around town as they get into the manufacturing phase of their, of their new operations. Tell me about TwistLock. TwistLock is, uh, is a great example of a, a company that came to us by partnership with LED. Uh, part of the story is that the, uh, the CTO of the company is a local guy and he had been a Microsoft employee for a number of years, uh, helped co-found this particular company, Twistlock, and decided they wanted to bring it back home. Uh, LED worked with them to, to arrange for them to, to land here, and they're uh, sitting in the building right next door to us now. Uh, they started with just a handful of employees. I think they have about 16 staff already within less than a year. And their big news, which has been in the press quite recently, is that the company was just acquired for $410 million, and that deal is, I think, close to closure right now. They do cybersecurity, uh, container-based cybersecurity. Many of the large 
sort of Fortune 500 companies are using their business. You wouldn't know it, you'll never see it, it's, it's, in, it's uh, behind the scenes. I think this quote that I got from uh, a representative over there last week was that seven out of 10 of the Fortune 10 companies use their services. So it's, uh, it's cloud security because obviously so many transactions these days happen not on a piece of paper but in the cloud and, and it's really important for companies to be able to make sure that's secure and they provide that service. So we're able, again, with, with LED's uh, partnership and, and great assistance, to move them from Portland, Oregon, to this operation here. And that's a great win for, for Baton Rouge and for LSU. David Winwood, thank you so much. Here now is a closer look at another success story there. The company is Lubricity Labs, and they are all about hair. We're going to walk right now into one of the labs of Lubricity with Dr. Boyce Clark, the inventor, the founder of this product. And what exactly are we seeing right here in this big vat? So this is our mixing room. Uh, we have chemical storage here. This is where we actually make all the products. So all the Lubricity products are made here by hand by me. Lubricity is a real word. It means to reduce friction or to make a surface smooth. And that's what our products do. They're intended to smooth the hair. So here in, in Louisiana where we have lots of high humidity, people with longer hair are very familiar with the issue of the humidity goes up and their hair starts to frizz and get really big. That's the origin of the company. My daughter, when she was 12, she's 16 now, had to be frank, terrible hair. It was frizzy all the time. I didn't know what to do. I reached out to friends and they told me there's this salon treatment that you can get. Uh, they said, tell me more. They said, well, it takes hours to do it. It costs hundreds of dollars and it uses formaldehyde as the active ingredient. I wasn't comfortable putting formaldehyde on really anyone, much less a 12 year old child. So I used my PhD in chemistry to develop a product that is formaldehyde free. All of our products are naturally derived produces the same result, gives amazing smoothness to the hair, and controls frizz. You have a test board that we can look at. Right, as we launch new products before it goes on actual client's hair, this is uh, hair tresses, they're all from a single mannequin, so they're all identical. So what we'll do is uh, we'll put the products on, to do different times, different temperatures, different hair color bases, and things like this to determine how the hair is going to respond to it. We do direct to consumer where we sell lots of things directly and ship it to your house, but we also have uh, professional only products that are sold through a local distributor and that's sold directly to salons. And again, our thanks to everyone at Innovation Park for helping us bring this information to you. If you've got an idea, you can check out their website, lsu.edu, Innovation Park. Women are one of the fastest growing state prison populations and in Louisiana, the rate of those behind bars is significantly higher than the national average. It sure is. A recent exhibit at the Newcomb Art Museum at Tulane in New Orleans featured art inspired by the experiences of women locked up. Producer Dorothy Kendrick filed this story for LPB's Art Rocks. Louisiana until last year was the prison capital of the world. We incarcerate one out of 75 adults in Louisiana. Former Attorney General Loretta Lynch said, when you incarcerate a mother, you actually incarcerate a family. So we decided to see what are the root causes for us, Louisiana, to be considered the prison capital of the world. What's happening? And so we went to the directly impacted community and we asked from their expertise, their lived experiences, why do you feel this is happening? And so together with them, we decided to identify four themes that are explored in the exhibition. One of them are root causes. Why is there an increase of 834% of women in the prison system in the last 40 years? There's been the criminalization of maybe sex work. There's been the criminalization of a lot of situations where underserved communities fall themselves. 80% of the women in the prison system, for example, are mothers. My family committed an offense back in September of 1997 and uh, my husband and his nephew were detained and I uh, later turned myself in for a armed robbery charge where we tried to take money from a bank to assist us in the family's financial collapse that we were going through at the time. When I went to go pick up our son from school the same day that the robbery had occurred and when he gets in the car normally his father picks him up every day. So when I picked him up, the first thing he wanted to know was where was his father. 
and I had to explain to him that his father was in jail. He released this loud, screeching bellow that just ripped my heart out of my chest. He immediately began to scream and bang on the car dashboard, no. You know, like he even had a clue of what it meant. When my husband was on trial, they had arrested me for the jury tampering. And so I was in jail and um, I got my first prenatal care because when my husband came home on bond, I got pregnant. And he was at home for four months on bond, then they started his trial. When I'm in jail, arrested on these two counts of jury tampering, they finally take me to the doctor so that I can be seen for my OBGYN appointment. And in that appointment, they do the ultrasound and these, uh, I'm in handcuffs and shackles with an arm guard on my side and an arm guard outside of my door. The obstetrician comes over, moves the handcuffs out of the way and does the sonogram and two heads pop up on the screen. And all I could do was burst out into this loud, joyous cry. I'm thinking to myself, my God, you must be sending me a sign that even though I'm at the darkest moment of my life for you to give me something so amazing, I knew that I was pregnant, but to have twins was unheard of in my family. I didn't think it was something that was even possible for me. And so to be presented with two lives at the darkest moment of my life, to me was just a sign from God to say, look fool, I got you, we're gonna be all right. Being completely powerless over what happens with your children. If you left children, I left five. My three sons, all were brutally shy. I had a daughter who had run away and had, you know, I was gone. For me, that's the hardest piece of being in prison. If you're a parent, every day I worried about every single day and my crime isn't who I am it's, it doesn't even begin to explain who I am. 82% of the women in the prison system have suffered substance abuse. 87% of the women in the prison system have suffered sexual abuse. When we went out there and interviewed 30 formerly incarcerated women in the community you see that some of them actually are telling more or less the same story. And so those stories are the ones that are here in the exhibition. Some of them are difficult to listen and difficult for the women to tell them to us. Many of them, it was the first time that anyone had asked them what happened. I think the first time I had been physically abused, I was three. And it lasted throughout my childhood to teenage years. So probably until I was about 16 or so. I was angry. I think a lot of times people don't realize that when people have been traumatized throughout their lives, there's no correct and politically correct way to act out trauma. So in 2000, I was 19 years old. My charge was use of fire to commit a felony. Myself and three other individuals, we went to a car dealership and we took cars from the car dealership and in the process of taking the cars, we also burned the car dealership down. While I was incarcerated, I saw many women die. Um, many women lose their minds. Many women lose children, other family members, and it changed them substantially forever. I think that without that experience, I would not be the woman that I am today. So that's why I say I wouldn't change it. But if you had to ask me, would I do it again? Like today, would I go back into it? The answer would be no. <laughs> I did a lot of time in solitary confinement. I used to fight a lot when I first was incarcerated. I think it was a mixture of like fear, a mixture of not getting help with the trauma that I faced growing up and just really learning how to deal with it. We thought that art could be the perfect vehicle for informally educating our community on the issues of our community and to build some empathy and understanding. There's a lot of misunderstanding of the root causes for women to be in the prison system, what they go through in the prison system, for example, as mothers. 80% of them are mothers. Most of them are mothers of young children, and a lot of them are head of household. And so our questions to them also in the exhibition, how do you mother long distance, right? How are you able to educate your children? Who takes care of the children while you're inside the prison system? 60% of the women, when they encounter the justice system, they were unemployed. So that's kind of like the root causes we give this kind of overarching portrait of underserved community. For this and other stories, you can visit our Louisiana Digital Media archives at ladigitalmedia.org.
This month, Intergy, one of SWI's lead underwriters, earned a Civic 50 award for the fourth consecutive year. Yeah, the Points of Light Foundation, the world's largest organization dedicated to volunteer service, gives the award each year to the nation's 50 most community-minded companies. They recognized Intergy for civic engagement, sustainability, and social responsibility. Intergy employs about 13,000 people. Those workers log more than 100,000 hours of volunteer service each year. Hey, there is a new Miss Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Megan Cruz, Miss Louisiana Watermelon Festival, won the crown of Miss Louisiana last weekend in Monroe. She's from Bossier City, a student at LSU Shreveport, majoring in marketing and advertising. With her new title, she's now the official hostess for the state and a spokesperson for Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. She will compete in the Miss America pageant in Atlantic City in September, now called Miss America 2.0. And no Miss Louisiana has ever won Miss America, so Megan, you've got a big thing on your shoulders there and all the best to you Megan Cruz. Good luck to her. And that is our show this week everyone. Remember you can watch us and anything LPB anytime wherever you are with our brand new app. Download it for free from our app store. This upgraded version features news and public affairs, documentaries, how to's and many more programs. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For all of us at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting, with support from viewers like you.